Hi everyone, and thanks for coming out today. Um, I'm pleased to introduce and welcome our seminar speaker for this week, Dr. Catherine Heal. Uh, Dr. Heal is currently a scientist at Integral Consulting in Seattle, Washington, where she specializes in geochemistry and data analytics. Uh, prior to starting at Integral earlier this year, Dr. Heal was a Science Foundation uh, postdoc fellow in marine ecology at the University of Washington. Um, Catherine did her PhD and master's work in oceanography at the University of Washington, and her PhD thesis was on the power and promise of direct measurements of metabolites in marine systems. Why am I nervous? <laughs> You're the one giving the talk. Um, Catherine is an exceptional analytical chemist. Uh, she developed several new and complex analytical methods during her grad and postdoc work. Um, she's also a wrangler of big data, a brilliant thinker, and she's one of the best communicators I know. She's also a friend of mine. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing what Catherine has to share on her latest work on arsenic cycling in the ocean, featuring trace elements, lipids, and microbes. Um, I also hear that Catherine may end a few minutes early, so um, you might get a little bit of your Friday afternoon back. Um, take it away, Catherine. Awesome. Thanks, Nancy. Yeah, I, um, I'm hoping this is on the shorter side of the seminar because I don't really like talking to avatars for um, too long. So let me just get set up a smidge. Put all y'all in here. There we go. Awesome. So I am going to talk about arsenic in the ocean. Um, I'm going to talk about it a little bit as a trace element, um, how it interacts with lipids, and how microbes interact with it. Um, and to kind of start out, I'm going to first obviously do my acknowledgments because that's the next slide. Um, this work is all work from my postdoc. It was funded by the NSF and the Simons Foundation. Um, it was done mostly in Brandy Bundy's lab. Um, but also with support from Anita Ingalls and Ginger Armbrest. Um, and I had a lot of support in various fashions from samples to data analysis to literature searching from a lot of people um, in both uh, Anitra and Randy's labs and also beyond. Um, and then I'm going to show some field data from two different cruises including um, the chief scientist training cruise that I went on in 2019, and that's um, this crew down here. Um, so in a big picture, research-wise, I have been long interested in the role that small molecules play in both shaping microbial structure and mediating biogeochemical cycles. So throughout, in my PhD, I thought a lot about vitamin B12, um, and now I think about arsenic. Um, I, I do field work. Um, I've done a bunch of lab experiments. I use a pretty advanced mass spectrometry, and I do a lot of data analysis. Um, nowadays, in my role as an environmental consultant, I do mostly that last thing. I am the cat sitting in front of my computer banging on it, hoping to make it do my bidding. And I also still do some mass spectrometry on the interpretation side of the data. Um, but I haven't done much field work or lab experiment experiments. I've kind of moved on from those a little bit. Um, and the bread and butter of my PhD and my uh, postdoc were developing and applying tools to do metabolomics and lipidomics. And what I mean by that is metabolomics, and lipidomics is a type of metabolomics, I would say, um, is the measurement of small biomolecules that are the direct result of cellular activity. So these are things like the lipids that make up cell membranes, amino acids that make up your proteins. This is vitamin B12, which is a cofactor to make proteins work. Here's another cofactor that makes proteins work. And then we have um, things like DMSP, which is an osmolite and also a climactically active um, precursor, precursor to a climactically active compound. And all of these compounds are ones that microbes make 
and they uh, have roles in the life of microbes and also in the biogeochemical roles of nitrogen and sulfur and cobalt and carbon, obviously. Um, if you're a chemist, you might look at these and say, whoa, those must be hard to measure all at the same time, and you would be correct. Um, these are really analytically challenging measurements to make, um, to try to look for all of these and measure all of these in samples. Um, environmental samples is a whole other thing because they're incredibly complex and they have things like salt, if you've heard of that. It's a huge annoyance to me every day. Um, and so in general, the, the schematic that we use of how we measure these types of molecules is we take our sample, maybe a tissue lysate or some sort of like pre-processing um, of a sample, and we run it on liquid chromatography, um, which separates the compounds over time according to how they interact with the column that they're on. And then we introduce them um, to a mass spectrometer. And I use electrospray mass spectrometry for the most part, which gives us high resolution masses of the compounds in their original state. So we are actually measuring the compounds masses not just it broken up into pieces. Um, we get a mass feature, is what, what a peak over time of each one of these high resolution masses. Then we do some pretty fancy data analysis to align all those peaks between our runs. Um, and then we can run a whole bunch of standards as well. But we, uh, we used about 200 standards to get identifications of those compounds and quantifications of those compounds. So this is, a lot of my PhD work was developing these methods and then applying these methods. Um, and the development was a, it was a huge team effort. Um, and I just want to really acknowledge that this would, could not have been done by a single person, but needed a lot of resources and um, an amazing amount of brains to go behind getting this uh, method up and running. Um, and so then we started applying this method. So we've applied it to one organism in several treatments or several organisms in one treatment or over a natural mixed community over time or over a natural mixed community over space. And all of these um, can tell you different things and all with the same tool. You can learn how are organisms responding to different kinds of stressors? How does a uh, mixed community um, change its metabolism over the course of a day? Or how does a, um, a metabolite pool, which is like the source of some of the most basic um, respiration in the ocean, what, is, what does that look like over space? Does that pool of carbon actually change compositionally over space and, and to what degree? So um, I've done mostly community metabolomics. So looking at the metabolites in um, the natural community, in, in which case we just take a, a bucket of water and filter it, and then we look at what's on that filter. And we get a lot of data, and some of that, and a lot of that work is really hypothesis generating. So this is just an example from a paper where I have a bunch of different organisms that we've, we've measured. Um, I think this is like 400 different compounds, 400 different metabolites in, and um, they have different patterns over these different organisms. So these these compounds um, are only in diatoms. It's kind of interesting. And then we can look at those same compounds over space, and we can see that some compounds um, go up over space or uh, they, they decrease over, um, this is from south to north along this transect. And, and that's all well and good, and we can learn a ton about, about that. But um, this talk was about arsenic, right? <laughs> so where is the arsenic? Well, the arsenic is one of these compounds. So while I was doing this process of creating these huge kind of data sets of untargeted community metabolites and, and learning about them on a whole, I was also getting identifications and patterns of compounds that have never been measured in the ocean before, and one of which was arsenobutane. And so this compound is, it's totally fascinating to me, which is why I did a whole postdoc on it. <laughs> Um, so this is a compound, it's pretty small, it has this little arsenic here, it's a zwitter ion. Uh, most people think it's used as an osmolite in cells, so those are compounds that help maintain the trigger or internal pressure so cells don't burst um, or get you know, squished by, uh, by having a differential of um, ion intensity inside and outside of a cell. And this compound has a very interesting pattern over space. 
um, compared to most of our metabolites that we see. Um, so in most of every single death profile that we measure metabolites in, and these are in particles, so inside of cells, in general, the metabolites follow the biomass, right? That makes sense. There are more cells, so there are more compounds made by cells. That's like not a big, you know, groundbreaking. So in the surface, there is more, um, there's more biology, there's more microbes, and this attenuates with death. And this is a, a pretty regular old compound, glycine betaine. We know a lot about this in the literature and in the world. And arsenobetaine has this totally bizarro pattern where it actually accumulates with depths, and this is inside of cells, um, and then it falls off. And we see this again and again, and this, pretty much this one profile uh, spurred the rest of my work um, in arsenic. So maybe you don't think about arsenic every day, and you don't think about elements every day, but just as a reminder, arsenic is here in the periodic table. It's right next to uh, its good friend, phosphorus. And in a lot of ways, it's very similar to phosphorus. In the ocean, phosphorus and arsenic have the same inputs, mostly from dust and rivers. And it has the same sinks, sedimentations and hydrothermal. So in the, that case, the whole geological cycle of arsenic is tied to the geological cycle of phosphorus. They also have similar residence times in the ocean um, on the same order of magnitude. So again, on this huge, huge, big picture, um, very similar um, sources, sinks, residence times as far as phosphorus goes. It actually has the same, uh, a pretty similar distribution in space as well. So a typical phosphorus profile, uh, this is dissolved phosphorus, phosphate mostly. Um, we have this typical nutrient-like profile and that's a little bit enhanced in the Atlantic compared, excuse me, in the Pacific compared to the Atlantic. And arsenate actually has a nutrient-like profile too. It's less intense. Um, it only has about a 25% increase with depth, but then also you see this increase between the two basins. Um, so we, we consider arsenic having a nutrient-like profile just as um, phosphorus does. And so my kind of goal with this um, talk, I guess, and, and in general, this type of research is to understand how microbes are interacting with arsenic and therefore shaping its distribution in the world's ocean. Um, so in, in order to think about microbes, we have to think about arsenic and phosphorus from a microbes perspective. Microbes don't care about the distribution of phosphorus in the ocean, they care about what it's looking like right in their environment. And they see phosphate and arsenate. These are the two main forms of phosphorus and arsenic in the ocean, and they look very similar, right? They're both oxidized in the same way, and they have um, very similar structure. And because of that very similar structure, sometimes arsenic, arsenate gets accidentally brought into the cell through a phosphate transporter. And that's called enzyme promiscuity. It's very normal. And that is kind of the scale in which that we have to think for a microbe. Because phosphate is needed for every microbe, every life, in order to do anything. But it's not perfect. Arsenic, arsenate isn't the right molecule. Phosphate is the right molecule. And it's very simple to understand why. Because the phosphorus oxygen bond is slightly shorter than the arsenic oxygen bond. And it's pretty, maybe you remember from your very intro uh, chemistry that longer bonds are weaker bonds. And the way that phosphorus works in cells is often in this phosphorus oxygen phosphorus or phosphorus oxygen carbon formation. So this is uh, ATP or in DNA, it's the same type of um, connection. And so if you try to put an arsenic here, it falls apart because it's weaker. And that is actually the really basic underlying foundation for the toxicity of arsenic. It cannot, it sometimes gets 
placed where phosphate phosphorus should be, but it doesn't act as a phosphorus can act. So arsenic is similar to phosphorus, but it's not similar enough in a microbe sense. Well, I want to make the argument that in the surface ocean, organisms are really exposed to arsenic because at depths, the phosphorus to arsenic is really high. And so for every phosphorus that a uh, phosphate that an organism is interacting with, it's only interacting with a tiny, tiny bit of arsenate. And so the influx into a cell of, of arsenic is pretty low. And that's, a, that's what I would consider a low arsenic exposure regime. But in the surface ocean, phosphorus can be, phosphate can be super, super low. And so in bats and aloha, you can actually have the same amount of phosphate and arsenic, or even sometimes even more arsenic than phosphate. And in those cases, for every single phosphate ion that an organism is interacting with, it's also interacting with an arsenic ion. And so then you can have really high exposure. And I do want to make the point that this enzyme, the phosphate transporter, isn't just like open for business for arsenate. It is somewhat, um, it does differentiate, but it doesn't differentiate perfectly between the two ions. So because in the surface ocean, there's high arsenate exposure, organisms, microbes have kind of creative strategies, I say, um, to deal with arsenic. And the first step of that is always to reduce it to arsenite, um, this ion. And then there's two kind of forking strategies. There's the efflux strategy, which pumps it out of the cell, but then doesn't really remove it from the situation because it could just come back after this. It can be auto oxidated back and back into the cell. Or you can methylate it. And methylating it actually connects a carbon to the oxygen or to the arsenic, excuse me, um, either in once or twice, usually twice. And this compound is much less toxic. Um, and so we think of this as a detoxification pathway, the methylation. But we don't know. Oh, and we can, there's great evidence, geochemical evidence of both of these pathways existing in the ocean. Um, we see a buildup of arsenite, so that effluxed um, ion, and we see a buildup of this DMA, the dimethyl arsenic acid. And so that's the methylated ion. So we have good evidence that both of these do happen out in the surface ocean. These are data from Station Aloha in the Pacific. Um, but we also have good evidence from genomic evidence, looking at the genomes of widespread phytoplankton, um, that the pathway of methylation is much more widespread than the efflux pathway. Um, and that's really interesting to me because the, the fate of this dimethyl arsenic acid is kind of unclear. We think it might be exported from cells because we do see it build up in this dissolved phase. So that's a possibility. Um, it could also be accumulated in cells and then those cells are ripped open and then they're exposed to the dissolved pool. And, or it could be, these could be precursors to other organic arsenic compounds. And in the literature for seaweed and fish and um, a lot of other like edible things from the ocean, you, there's a lot of arsenic and a lot of organic arsenic compounds in those, those food sources. Um, and I, I don't know if anyone's really thought about how that can be like where they come from too much. And so that's where I keep thinking about um, this process of methylation, of, of putting that carbon on the oxygen. This is the first step to make any organic um, organic arsenic compound. So my kind of driving questions um, in this work were which organisms make organic arsenic um, metabolites or compounds in the surface ocean and which compounds are they making and then what are the fate of those compounds. So um, to answer the first question of which organisms are making organic compounds, I focused on the well-characterized gene that methylates the arsenite. And I use a hidden Markov model approach to mine metatranscriptomes for this gene. 
And I want to give a big, big shout out to Bryn Durham, who I believe was your speaker last week. Um, she taught me how to do this and kind of held my hand through this as a chemist and she as a biologist. Um, and so uh, this is a really cool technique to be able to kind of peer into the ocean and see who is doing this function out there or, or kind of see that. Because if you don't think about the central dogma of biology every day, the transcriptome is kind of this middle ground. So the genome is really like the blueprints. What can an organism do? What can an organism do if every gene in it worked? The transcriptome is then, hey, this is these are the, the parts of my DNA that I'm trying to do right now. These are the messages I want to send to the ribosomes in my in my um, cell in order to make proteins. And the proteins are like the tiny machines that get the work done. So the transcriptome is like the blueprints to make the machines that they want made right then and there, and specifically mRNA. And so the way that this works is that I build a tree, I build, I build a phylogenetic tree using this gene, this well-characterized gene as its basis. And so we have some um, demonstrated activity um, of organisms that have, uh, we know do this process and we know their gene, what it looks like. And then we can go out into the environment, um, measure the transcripts, the transcripts out there, and we can map onto this tree, where did those transcripts lie? So that we can find out how much um, of the transcripts there, who belongs to them. So it's a little bit quantitative um, and also who's transcribing this process. So I'm gonna, just gonna show some data from Station Aloha for this one gene. And if we look overall in the transcription um, kind of bucket that's happening out there at Station Aloha, we see that the main signal we see are from eukaryotes. So it's not very specific, but that's the level of specificity that this particular um, analysis does. But we also see a huge chunk, about a quarter of the transcript pool um, from Prochlorococcus, the um, picocyanobacteria that dominates in oligotrophic oceans um, and uh, has a very small streamlined genome. So these are organisms that have kind of decided only to keep the things that are necessary. And so the fact that we see them transcribing this gene out there in the ocean, um, to me means that this is a necessary gene for them to kind of thrive in, in their area. We have also used a um, technique to look just at the uh, um, the transcripts that are from eukaryotes. So these are um, multicellular, um, excuse me, not multi, have organelles, eukaryotes. And from that pool, we see it dominated by dinoflagellates. That's not a surprise if you um, think about transcripts at all, and we're happy to talk about that more if you're interested, but also a big signal from haptophytes, and these are di um, diatoms and um, some non-dinoflagellates, uh, non-dinoflagellate alveolates. So these are some other major um, phytoplankton groups, actually, um, some of which are mixotrophs, but also um, major phytoplankton groups. So overall in the ocean, I think in the surface ocean, it's not too much of a surprise, but it's nice to see it kind of reiterated in this transcriptional space that eukaryotic and prokaryotic phytoplankton are doing this methylation and this creation of these organic arsenic compounds. And in particular, prochlorococcus. And I'm going to come back to that organism later. Um, so when I create metabolomics data, it is in a, a very open way. I just let the instrument see what the instrument can see. And sometimes if I know what a compound, what compound might be out there, I can actually go back and mine that data. So this is uh, just an example. So over time, we have all these compounds coming out and we have a general ion signal. So these are just a count of all the ions that come out at time. And at each microsecond, I get a spectra. And so these are exact masses that come out at this particular time. And these masses correspond to different compounds. And so if you know a compound, you can go into the mass spectrometry data and say, hey, is that compound there? And you can use some tricky, some tricky data analysis to say if it is or isn't, or maybe is, or definitely isn't. And so what I did is um, with the help of 
um, with the help of some undergrads, created a big list of a bunch of compounds from the literature of organic arsenic compounds, and then we mined this environmental metabolomics data. And without standards, we can't quantify it, but we can look at the patterns. Um, and so what we see is that we can see compounds like this one. So this one has three carbons on the arsenic. These two we've already seen, the one and two carbons. Um, and these uh, simple um, or organic arsenic compounds, in size, in, as far as inside of particles, they all attenuate with depth. So if we remember what arsenobetaine, that interesting profile, that had that mid water column um, increase where these all attenuate with depth. Um, but we also found some, some really interesting compounds that were more complex. So these compounds that have this arsenic here, it's got a couple carbons, they've got the sugary bit, they've got this glycerol, sometimes they have a phosphorus and another glycerol, sometimes they have a sulfonate, sometimes they have a sulfate. We've seen all combinations of these Again, all attenuating with depth. These are really kind of fascinating compounds that we don't know much about, but they're out there in the ocean. So someone's making them just on their day to day. And then the big kind of surprise that we found was that um, seven to 20%, depending on our samples of the particulate arsenic. So we took the total particulate arsenic of a sample and then we separated it into its um, lipid soluble fraction. We found that 20% of the arsenic was in this lipid soluble fraction. Um, and the way we do this, it, this kind of measurement is very different from the metabolite measurement. So again, we have chromatography. So we have our samples that are separating out over time. And these individual peaks now are compounds, but our detector is different. So instead of just looking at all of the compounds coming out at once, we use ICPMS, so inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. And this kind of mass spectrometry actually kind of like blows up every molecule into its like tiniest parts, so like the individual elements. And so we are just looking at the arsenic. So over time, we can see that there's arsenic here, not arsenic, arsenic here, not arsenic. So that's kind of what we're seeing here. And so when we ran our lipid ex extracts on the ICPMS, and we get these, these really interesting chromatograms, we're seeing that there are lipids, but they're not just, it's not just like arsenic is stuck in a lipid -y solution. Like the arsenics are the lipids. They are, the arsenic is in the lipid compounds themselves. And that's an important distinction because sometimes you get kind of just big humps of, of these kind of data in which you have a loose kind of association of an element with a mixture of humix, say, that's common in like siderophore work. Um, and these are particular compounds and we have peaks like this. So then we can take these same exact samples and we can run them on the other instrument, the instrument that tells us all the compounds. And we can start to identify these individual compounds. So the way this works, so now the gray behind there is the ICPMS trace, and I apologize, these are not the same order as the figure before. Um, so these are the ICPMS traces, and then we can, we can, what I did is I built this in silico library of kind of possible arsenic lipids that are from the literature and then rearrangements of those and stuff like that, and I, I looked for them in uh, all of my samples. And I looked for them in a few different dimensions. One is that, was there a peak in the mass that I was expecting? So this one, obviously there's a peak. Does it align with one of the peaks from the arsenic trace? And this one aligns with this early peak. Finally, when I, when I blast that molecule into pieces, does it have a fragmentation that makes sense? And that's called the MS2 fragmentation spectra. And, and um, so these are the MS2s of the compounds that are, are shown on the first part of the panel. And what's beautiful about arsenic is that it has a very particular mass that makes it really easy to find in mass spectrometry data. It has a mass defect, it's called. And so I know that these two masses, this 104.968 and 122.979, those masses cannot be made from any combination of elements that don't have arsenic. So I know, I absolutely know that those two masses have arsenic. 
So that's kind of the sleuthing that you have to do in order to, to match these two types of data, to be able to identify and quantify, um, because the, the arsenic traces are quantified and the uh, ESI traces are identified chemically. So the single chemicals. And so that's what the colors on the first plot that I didn't show before are these different compound classes, um, different lipid compound classes. And this uh, methodology has been applied to characterizing um, siderophores in the ocean for iron bound compounds, for characterizing um, nickel bound cofactors and cobalt bound cofactors. Um, and I learned this methodology in Randy Bundy's lab as part of my, as part of my postdoc. So I'm just going to walk through a couple of the compound structures that I found. Um, the first one is this blue one. So that's kind of these earlier peaks. I saw this compound in every sample I've looked at. Um, this is what we call an arsino hydrocarbon. Um, these are pretty common actually in a lot of different types of algae, macroalgae mostly. Most of the study has been done on seaweed. Um, fish and actually some bacteria have been shown to make this or accumulate it, um, depending on the studies. Uh, lots of organisms have made these compounds. Um, the next class of compounds are these these orange ones, kind of in the middle range, and this is the dominant class in some of our in some of our samples. And these are arsino sugar phospholipids. It's a little bit long, but I'll walk you through it. Some arsino. Here's some sugar. Phospholipid. And um, these have been shown. Well, one, this part of the molecule is that arsino sugar that I've been seeing. So that holds. That makes sense. Somebody's making this head group and then putting on lipids and probably using it in their membrane. Um, and these kind of sugars, they can accumulate in brown macroalgae, um, specifically brown macroalgae. And those are relatives of diatoms. And although no one has shown that these particular um, compounds have been made by diatoms, I think it's pretty safe to assume that they probably are, and that uh, it's probably worth testing. But we have seen that the diatoms can make the sugar phospho head group. Um, so I think it's likely that they are a source of these compounds out there in the environment. And the last group of compounds that we saw are similar, um, but different in a very important way. So they are also arsino sugar phospholipids, but they have this really important distinction in that they have an ether connection instead of an ester connection. And for those people who think about lipids, this is an incredibly important distinction that usually tells us that it's a different organism. And ether lipids are less common in, well, I shouldn't say that. Ether lipids generally indicate that it's an archaeal source, but that's a generally a different kind of ether lipid or a bacterial source, but generally tell us that it's not eukaryotes. So diatoms, probably making this one or likely could make this one. Um, and the, this one, I cannot imagine a diatom making because, because of this particular connection. And that's kind of important because the grand literature about arsenic in the ocean really points to algae, either microalgae or macroalgae, but eukaryotic algae as the kind of source for these arsenic lipids. And this, to me, hints that we're, we should be thinking a little bit more about bacteria. And it's possibly those Prochlorococcus picocyanobacteria that could be important. And these have, have never been seen before in any system. So that was kind of fun, too. Um, so our second question of, of what organism, what um, compounds are present, um, we kind of have simple to complex, um, particularly uh, some pretty interesting looking uh, arsenic lipids. And finally, um, I just kind of want to talk about what I think the fate of these arsenic metabolites are, and this is very conjecture. <laughs> um, but there, there's a fair amount of literature that suggests that these small polar compounds, these kind of intermediate sugars, and then these larger arsenic lipids by certain organisms are broken down and degraded into 
carcine or butane. And it's that's a really interesting this, um, hypothesis that has been hinted at, but hasn't had great evidence for. Um, and there's no single or there's arsenobutane accumulates in fish really high. And because of that, and because it has arsenic, there's been a lot of studies about it because of human health consumption of fish. Um, and arsenobutane is uh, really innocuous. It, it can accumulate in organisms and it's really not toxic. Um, and maybe at certain levels, but at levels that would be very, very, very high. And but no organism has been um, seen to make arsenobutane from just arsenic. So it has to go through some intermediate organic arsenic. Okay. So I think I can explain my strange um, shape of arsenobutane by invoking that it is a persistent intermediate of the organic arsenic degradation. Um, so I didn't need to show this, I've already shown this, but just again to reiterate how different it is from most of the compounds um, shapes in the ocean that I've measured. And just to reiterate this shape I see over and over again. So here's um, four different depth profiles from 23, 33, uh, 37, and 41 north. And we see again and again, this low at the surface accumulates at depth and then comes back down. Interestingly, as you as you move north, you have a, a higher phosphorus to arsenic ratio, and you also have a, um, a lower um, total particulate arsenic maximum. So that's I don't quite know how to what to make of that yet, but I think it's pretty interesting. And just as a little tiny tidbit, it's not the only compound I think is involved in this as a persistent during immediate. This this compound that just has one extra carbon in the middle is beta alanine arsenobutane. Um, it's a very similar. I'm just going to pop to the first one again, but it, it's a little bit different. It has a deeper maximum. Oh, fascinating. So just to kind of tie it all back together, here's here's what I kind of think is happening. Here's my working hypothesis. Um, in the surface ocean, uh, cyanobacteria and algae take up arsenic because of its similarity to phosphorus in areas of low phosphorus to arsenic. A portion of this arsenic um, is actually put into complex biomolecules like arsenic sugars and lipids. Um, oh, that's an orange spot. Um, and then some of this biomass sinks and a different organism as they're degrading these arsenic lipids and sugars, um, they make this arsenobutane and then they use it as an osmolite. They use it to maintain their internal pressure and maybe they kind of leave it at that form in order to prevent accidental um, toxification of themselves as they're degrading these um, important substrates of lipids and sugars. And then finally, deeper in the water column, somebody else, some other organism, I don't know who, um, must be using this arsenobutane as a substrate and complete the remineralization of arsenic. So that's kind of the grand scheme of what I think is going out there. I think I've got some decent evidence. There's still some pieces that need to get put together. Um, and I think that's all I've got. I meant to end on this slide um, of just kind of my big questions and my simple answers. So from there, I will take any questions people have. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah. Oh, really exciting. Um, beautiful slides as usual. Um, <laughs> so yeah, the, uh, we like to give students the opportunity to ask questions first, um, if they would like. So I will, let me see if I can get the list up here. Uh, do we have any uh, questions from students? All right, I'll open it up to everybody. I think I saw a hand, maybe Steve Murawski. 
Yes. Um, thanks very much for a really interesting seminar. Very much appreciate it. Um, I'm thinking about your profiles in the ocean of uh, arsenic-related compounds, and I wonder if you could speculate on the sources of these. Uh, are the, is it simply just recycling in the ocean, or is there some ambient uh, source that, uh, uh, particularly in the Pacific Ocean, that might um, actually be creating an issue for biota there? Mm, like a source of arsenic, like an anthropogenic source or something like that? Well, you know, there's a lot of gold mining in Alaska. Yeah, yeah, I I have often wondered this. Um, I've thought about, hey, could I pitch this as a, should I look for changes in arsenic in the ocean? And what kind of, um, what kind of global kind of scale, um, you know, perturbations to the arsenic cycle are possible, right? Um, and I think I have a few ideas. One, it would be hard to get arsenic contamination out in the middle of the ocean. Um, so I do think that in this area it's near Station Aloha, this is this is pretty pristine arsenic um, concentrations, um, mostly because arsenic is pretty sticky, actually, um, as uh, actually phosphate is kind of sticky, too. So it, it's not it's not going to be transported super, super far. Um, second is that it is um, not very soluble. So uh, you would need a huge input to have a little bit of dissolved change. Um, and that most of it's the anthropogenic sources that I can think of are, um, are on heavier or like coarser situations that are poorly transported by wind. Um, but I do think that arsenic perturbation, or perturbation to the arsenic cycle is very real and probably underfunded and understudied in coastal regimes and in lakes because oftentimes lakes experience really low phosphorus the ligotrophic lakes and forest fires are a major um, uh, source of arsenic to natural systems yep. Th thanks my uh connection is a little bit weird so i just turned my camera off but um do we have any other questions Dave? Yeah, I just had a question about, the, can, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, uh, I just had a question about the uh, depth profiles. You know, it, it's interesting that they, they have a maximum at 250 meters or so. What, what does that tell you? I mean, is it anything related to a, a, a thermocline or alocline or anything like that? Hmm. I haven't thought about that too much. I know that um, in these four depth profiles, for instance, we, um, at least the deep chlorophyll max in the southernmost is probably about between one, 120 and 150 meters. It's quite deep. And then as you move north, it shoals a lot. It's more like 30 meters. So um, I would assume that you have similar shoaling of the neutrocline as well, but corresponds with that. And this doesn't show that same kind of shoaling. So it, it's really confusing to me, but these are really the only depth profiles that exist, um, and I haven't thought about too much about the physics. Well, that's interesting. Uh, good luck mm -hmm. on figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Any students? All right, Alex. Hi, uh, I just got a quick question. Um, I, I read a while ago about a few species of um, bacteria that can use heavy metals like arsenic as a uh, terminal electron acceptor. Do you think that that might be contributing to the nutrient-like profile in, in addition to the phosphorus incorporation? Yeah, great question. I love those studies. Um, so, no. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think, and here's why, um, those organisms, one, that process is probably, um, at least in modern times, um, more exclusive to uh, oxygen and ozone, um, and for a very minimal part of the interact of like comparing to the concentration of arsenic, which is actually kind of high, it's not in the animal or in terms of the animal or situation. Um, the interaction is that is a tiny, tiny bit of the arsenic. And 
And so far, I have not seen any evidence that those organisms that interact with arsenic as an electron acceptor or, um, or other ways of har harnessing that oxidation power inside of the arsenic, um, they don't interact with it in an organic sense. If that makes sense. They don't add that carbon to it. That seems to be a relic of the organisms that have to deal with it as far as um, it being toxic. So I think the, the the kind of dogma is that you put this methyl on it in order to, to tell it apart from phosphate inside your cell. Whereas if you were using arsenic to breathe, you wouldn't need that. You would want to know arsenic is in its right form so you can use it to like get energy um, or to, to breathe, depending on the organisms. Um, so I think those are really different organisms than the ones who are doing this methylation. Yeah, it just I the paper I read like talked about that specifically. It was the effluent of a glass manufacturing plant and had some like really polluted water. So I guess that makes sense. It wasn't normal oceanic conditions. But there are normal oceanic conditions in which those processes occur, and those are um, ones that are. Um, kind of cool. And probably back in time, way back in time, those were pretty common biochemical alterations of arsenic. Thank you. Uh, it looks like we have another question. Uh, Brad Rosenheim. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. That was uh, fascinating. I'm going to ask you kind of a wild question here, but it it kind of um it stems from your very clear explanation of arsenic toxicity. That was one of the most the clearest way I've ever heard it put in terms of bond strength. That was really cool, actually. Uh, but it got me thinking, and I was wondering if um if, for instance, the arsenic to phosphorus ratio on Earth were different, you know, like and I'm getting at other planets here or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, could could life have developed around this um, element by forming different types of lattices around it, you know, that didn't put yeah. so much strain on the bond? You know, is, is that so far fetched? Yeah, I love this question. Um, <laughs> I <laughs> also appreciate you asking me, not asking me if it can go in DNA, because I hope I made that pretty clear. Right, yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> um, and for students who maybe weren't around 10 years ago, someone mm -hmm. claimed that organisms that there are special bacteria on Earth and maybe in space that could put arsenic into DNA, and, and that's that unfortunately is not true. Um, but <laughs> so if out in the universe somewhere or in a parallel universe, there were a situation where life had to evolve with arsenic as its phosphate replacement. Um, I don't see why not, but they'd have to be quite creative about it and they would have to employ lattices, chemical structures that are very different than the phosphate structures that exist in our um, systems. And so it still would have to be quite a bit different. It's, it's, yeah. It's pretty, yeah. pretty the, big difference. Okay. That oxygen arsenic bond is, is super weak. And in fact, okay. I don't really talk about it, but um, these oxygens we consider exchangeable. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the whole basis of any arsenic organic compound has to be rooted in this carbon oxygen, excuse me, carbon arsenic bond. Arsenic. Yeah. Um, because these ones just pop on and off, even if they're double ones. Right. And that's cool. And, and as a follow-up on that, you know, because that bond is so weak, um, just trying to find, uh, you know, in, 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 in sort of extreme environments like hot springs or something like that, you, it, it probably it makes it even less likely, mm. right? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, more energy, easier to break for sure. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for the yeah. talk. So maybe if it was super cold, I don't know. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Um, I guess this is maybe sort of an analytical chemistry question, which honestly I haven't uh, done a lot of recently, but um, so it seems like a lot of what you were able to uncover about arsenic kind of uh, relies on this sort of serendipitous fact that it has this mass anomaly 
that makes it really easy to detect. Mm -hmm. um, so, so does that mean like if you wanted to apply these same methods to other things, you couldn't get as much information? Um, yeah. And if so, like, what's the next thing in analytical chemistry that would allow you to like do this or do this better? Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, this technique of, of pairing, pairing, you know, so many dimensions, right? We have a dimension of, of time in our, our full mass. We have a dimension in time in the arsenic. We have a spectral dimension of what it looks like when we break it up. The more dimensions we have, the more chance we have to um, identify compounds. And the, the more unique any of those dimensions are, the more chances we have of identifying a compound. So one of the like um, challenges is to identify those uniquenesses <laughs> of different types of compounds. So in the arsenic's case, it doesn't arsenic doesn't have a um, well, in arsenic's case, it's this mass defect. That's our best chance. Um, there are other elements that also have um, good, we call them, mass defects. <laughs> and that just means mm -hmm. that it's mass of 75. You know, that's like a atomic number, but it's mass it's, is like 74.992 or something like that. Right, like far enough right? from an even number that you, yeah. Right, exactly. That's an, And a negative mass defect is a little bit rare. Um, especially if you think about organic and carbon hydrogen both have impossible chemistry. Anyway, but there are other really tricky ways that you can look for um, specific compounds. Yeah, the other major one is using a um, in MS1 space to use a different um, isotope. So uh, arsenic only has one isotope, only one stable isotope. So that kind of sucks actually, but Iron has um, a few stable isotopes, including one that's lower, which is unusual, but it's major one. So then you can employ a trick in this dimension. So it's it's hard because these techniques aren't typed together. No one's done the work of like incorporating every single technique to every single metabolomics measurement. Um, and then I think we're a ways off from that. But if you have a question and uh, a good listening abilities, you can really get after things inside of these data. Yeah, super cool. Mm -hmm. And and definitely that was not to downplay your, your methods at all, but you know, oh, no, no, of, no. Uh, that's a, it's a great question. You know, pieces that kind of have to fall in line for you to be able to do something. I would imagine there are a lot of dead ends, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and you can you can be really tricky about how you there's a lot of like, you know, non detects. I search for thousands and thousands and thousands of things and I don't see them, but I also like, I shouldn't see everything. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, the combining all these techniques into like one pipeline that's useful is always helpful. Great, thank you. And and I see a, a new a hand from uh, Isabel. From Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I have a question. Um, this is a little bit different. I don't know if you you know about this, but um, so there are some studies that have shown there it's um, arsenic contamination in the oceans in some coastal areas. Based on what you found in the profiles in open ocean, do you think there's any possibility that these uh, continued inputs of our man-made arsenic could affect this um, biochemical? natural cycles um, based on arsenic in the oceans? Yeah, I think I've thought about it a little bit more on the coastal side of things. So we know, like you said, that there are areas in the coast that are affected. Um, it is possible that that pollution, let's say, um, can be transported into the open ocean. I think there hasn't, as far as I can tell, there hasn't been great evidence for that, but I think it's absolutely possible um, depending on the scales that you're talking. Um, but we also know that these kind of strategies that um, organisms use to deal with arsenic are really organism specific. And not all organisms have the same ability or the same biochemical avail avail ability to deal with it. So I think you could easily get situations where you have too much arsenic and you kill, kill off certain 
portion of your microbial or phytoplankton community and a different part of the community flourishes because they do have some of the appropriate techniques. And then you probably would um, screw up the whole arsenic cycle area. <laughs> And also but those local. microbes that have the, the way to cope with arsenic maybe can be used as remediation yes. uh, rates to restore some coastal areas. Yeah, and, and that is definitely an active area of research, particularly with seaweeds. Um, Sargassa, mm -hmm. for instance, is a huge, uh, it's a, such an interesting organism in that it actually has pockets of organic, inorganic arsenic that it just like, it puts into like almost vacuole type things. Um, and then there are other brown algae that make these lipids that are, that's, they seem to just use it. They're like, well, it's here. It kind of looks like something that's useful. I'm going to put it into a useful molecule. Um, mm -hmm. So there's these really different mechanisms and the seaweed um, and macroalgae community has definitely looked into that as far as coastal remedies and arsenic. But then what happens, right? Then do you have to remove the seaweed? It's not like the arsenic goes away. It just gets tied up in a different form. So that's the real challenge of using these bio mm -hmm. remediation techniques. Very interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I don't know if that's a new hand, Brad. Let's do one more question and then um, we will call it a day. Brad, is that a new hand? No, oh, I, it's not. My hand isn't up on my computer. So I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Sorry All right. That. I guess it's gone. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Nope. All right, well, let's all thank Catherine by opening our mics and clapping. Round of applause. Thank you, great sea of dots. Excellent yeah. talk. <laughs> Thanks, Catherine, that was awesome.